Good space time, y'all, and welcome to a new episode of the Citizen Cosmos podcast, a source for educational insights into the world of Web3. Today we are joined by Sisla V. Abnishek, co-founder of the Omniflix Network. We dive into the creation of a blockchain specifically designed for creatives, envisioning a future where artists and innovators thrive in a decentralized ecosystem and discuss the power of content creation in our society. We discuss the importance of building communities in the Web3 space and examine whether our educational systems can ever be too challenging. Throughout our conversation, we explore the impact of language on knowledge acquisition and cross-cultural exchange, discuss the tapestry of Indian culture and its influence on decentralization. Additionally, we touch upon the consciousness of AI, its potential for mass accessibility and the role it plays in inspiring us to push the boundaries of creation. I think that shift has made people more conscious about something that is intangible, but is now like finally tangible and people can wrap their heads around it. All old notes were banned in four hours later, no old note could be used. Microsoft had all the resources, Linux had the community, they now power 98% of world servers. It's like that is what I see as community. Sometimes I look at the price of things in the shopping mall and I'm like, that costs 0.1 Ether. You are what you do repeatedly. Therefore, excellence is not an act, but a habit. Hi, everyone. Welcome to a new episode of the Citizen Cosmos podcast. And today I have an OG content creator with me, Sisla, the man, the one and only man from Omniflex, Sisla Man. Hi, welcome to the show. How are you? I'm doing great. Like glad to be here on the Citizen Cosmos podcast. Been hearing it, been following it, you know, know all the builders that are like, you know, coming down week after week and, you know, glad to see you continue even after all these years. So I'm pretty excited to be here. Thanks, man. Again, for all the listeners out there, I must say uh, Sisla is in my, not opinion, but I would say, of course, it's an opinion, but it's something that I see has been uh, a Cosmos OG creator since pretty much day one, you know, and um, there wasn't many content creators when Sisla and his team already had the idea of creating a whole blockchain dedicated today, which of course we will talk about today and ask. But first thing is first, Sisla, can you introduce yourself a little bit? Tell me about who is Sisla? What does he do in life? What are your interests? Why blockchain? What happened? Who are you, man? Tell us all about it. <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, I got started with computers back in about 2007. That was when I was in high school. And uh, yeah, like academics were one, but, uh, you know, I was more involved in, you know, as soon as I got access to the computer, uh, played a lot of Counter-Strike, you know, dealt a lot with Orkut communities, right? And uh, almost actually failed uh, one of my annual exams as well, because like three months before I got the computer and I was hooked. And yeah, that happened. But after that, like, you know, I found my love, you know, doing things that were never explored, exploring, you know, what could be possible. And because of that, you know, uh, started off on Orkut, being involved in communities, like I rose to being a moderator back then, not, not many, like Orkut is the equivalent of Facebook. Uh, and this was primarily in Brazil, India, and some of the other countries. It was by Google, but they shut it down, you know, after a while. That was where like I learned how to code because you could like modify your Orkut, uh, you know, page, you could do a lot of things with JavaScript. And that was my introduction to coding as well and exploring. So, you know, since then, like for the last, you know, 13, 15 years, you know, I've been hooked on to computers, freelance my way during college, uh, you know, built websites here and there, educated people about tech, people didn't care, some cared, you know, like uh, hung out with them. I'm also like, you know, I was pretty interested in uh, speed cubing. So I've competed at a national level, you know, hold, held a few national records. And, uh, you know, that was, that was what interested me. And even in college, like I worked part-time at a test assessment firm where we used to handle recruitment drives for like 6,000 students from multiple colleges. Like I was part of those ops. Again, like quickly rose to lead multiple teams there and that operational experience helps me even till today, right? So that is something that I've been thankful for. And, you know, I'm just now an extension of how I was during college, but like, you know, 10x where I am. So, yeah. Headshot. This is what I know from Counter-Strike. Headshot. <laughs> you, know, psh, you know, this was like a sniper shot story. Man, I didn't know that you participated in competitions and that you, you did all that. I know you have a computer science degree, but I wasn't aware of the competition thing. 
but I didn't know you managed to achieve so many things in terms of competition. Let me ask you a question, Sisla. I know it's a stigmatic question, but it's a good stigma. I know that India is one of those countries that has a very high level of computer producers, a very high level of computer engineers. One of the reasons for that, from what they say, from what people say in general, is due to, you know, a very hard educational system that is dedicated to study a lot, a lot, a lot. How was your experience studying computer science? How did you, was it like that or is it different in reality? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll have to keep it real. Uh, it is hard. The competition is like too high. People are like, you know, they really take their academics seriously. And for those that don't, they, to some extent, get left out if they can't figure things out by themselves. And, you know, everyone, like most people are like really good at math and science, not just like physics and chemistry, but also biology. So, you know, that has been personally for me a bit difficult to navigate. I was always like, you know, the average kid, you know, like the 10th, 20th rank. Or something like that in a class of say 40, 50 people. But yeah, like personally, I chose computer science because this is what I was interested in. And, uh, you know, for me, like I really, I scored like out of 80, I think, or 75, I scored, no, sorry, out of 100, I scored like 16 units. And I was using Linux for like three years before that, right? And everyone else that never even interacted with the Linux system, or they got like 80 or 19 units. So, the education system, like the, <laughs> the system is like to an extent favors like a different set of people. Uh, definitely not for me. I was like more the average kind, but I was interested in other things actually executing. And hence, like even in 12th or, you know, uh, yeah, like just into college, engineering college, I was already like, you know, working on various uh, projects with, uh, you know, other universities and built like robots, uh, went to competitions, like even before, like I got into college. So there's a summer break before you get into engineering college. Uh, even before that, like I participated in competitions using my identity as a college student. So yeah, like these are things that I did. Uh, luckily they turned out well for me, but uh, I personally chose computer science because I don't think I could have done anything else better than this. So yeah. You say you chose computer science because you don't think you could have done anything better. For sure, I think that's a lie. I'm sure you have many other skills, man. Come on. One, you build communities. That's already one skill you have. So you have a lot more skills than you think. But I mean, I understand that, you know, that was one reason to succeed, to do something that you like. But was there... What drew you to computers when you were a kid? You said that you participated, you know, before college with that. What What was the initial attraction? Why computers? Why not philosophy or, or psychology or English or, I don't know, Hindi or, or anything else? Why that particular subject? What made you fall in love with it? Yeah, I mean, in simple words, you can create something that doesn't exist. Uh, I know art is also like that. Yeah, I know, like, you know, being able to, like, you know, create something out of nothing is exists like across multiple like industries but here i was like extremely fascinated the most fascination is when you know like i could like interact with the command line or write a small html file where i could like see the output on a browser it is like really really simple right now but these were the things that like actually motivated me to do more like learn more and like get involved so, yeah, that makes sense, man. It's crazy to think now that we have all those AI tools, right? That, that just like <laughs> <laughs> let you do it in seconds, right? What we studied. Yeah. What do you think? That's what right. do you think, man? As a computer engineer, what do you think? How is it going to evolve? Where is it going? The whole AI thing. Wow. Like I'm thrilled. You know, I just want to like <laughs> live for as long as possible to see everything that, you know, that actually like, you know, progresses the world. Like, I think like the current set of like AI has been around, like even when we interact with Google, we just don't think that we're interacting with an AI, right? Like it's a search query that we are like typing, but you know, in this case, right? Like no one, when they use say Facebook or Twitter, they, they don't think that they're interacting with AI systems, but when they're like utilizing chat GPT, they're thinking that they are interacting with an AI machine, like uh, something that is like responding to them and so on and so forth. So, I think that shift has made people more conscious about something that is intangible, but is now like finally tangible and people can wrap their heads around it. 
and this i believe will lead to like quite a lot of interesting possibilities where ai is not just restricted for the smartest of the smart people but even accessible by everyone and yeah initially there'll be like a bit of a hassle when you know people might need to rescale upscale and so on and so forth but this will like you know improve productivity by 10x and just like how we start remembering phone numbers or something like that you know you'll like a lot of this information that we are like gathering right now and remembering and things like that of course it is helpful to remember important phone numbers but now you you can offload that to your phone just like that people will probably start to offload a lot of the activities to an ai which is like tailor made just like how our app chain cosmos app chain is tailor made for one specific purpose you know you can have an ai also being you know be tailor made for one specific purpose and we'll probably see much much more advancements in specific like industry specific ais i have a cheeky question for you now sisla how many phone numbers do you remember <laughs> <laughs> i think i remember like 10 or 15 And these are the people that I've been interacting Whoa. with like ten or fifteen years. So I know. Are this. you serious? <laughs> yeah. I are mean, you I serious? Yeah, you remember fifteen <laughs> phone numbers. Oh, you're saying that's a lot. Okay, okay. okay. Wow, <laughs> man, that is impressive, man. I mean, when I was a kid. Yes, yeah. yes. When I was a no, when I was a kid. Yes, when I was a kid, I remember like you know before mobile phones. Even I mean, I'm a child of the of the nineties. I grew up in the nineties. I'm a child of the eighties. I grew up in the nineties, but. I remember remembering house phone numbers, you know, and then at some point mobile phone numbers, but not too many. But wow, 15 numbers, man. You must love numbers because I don't remember 15 <laughs> numbers, more. No way. No way. Yeah, I hope my girlfriend isn't listening. I don't even remember her phone number. I hope she's not listening to this because I don't remember her phone number. So, I'm sorry. <laughs> I mean, the numbers I remember like they didn't change for like a decade. So, hence I remember. So, <laughs> <laughs> nice yeah. nice man yeah. man i have a complex question for you now you said that the reason you fell in love with computers was the ability to create something and that essentially led you to go and study computers and essentially you know participate in all those competitions succeed prove to yourself that you can do it if i understand correctly and then go on to build in what you are doing today which we will talk about but before we talk about that do you still think that you know your original desire of to build and create things by with the use of computer technology can you honestly say that this is what you're doing today is this is something you wanted to do actually yes i mean i i could have done more i mean these are like there are things that i could have done better but uh no 100% like i mean i'll just give you an example i bought my like i have a mac Mac laptop, no Mac Pro, Mac Book Pro, and I bought it in 2020. And uh, this has like, oh, not 2020, 2021, sorry. And you know, like buying that gave me like a sense of like, emp- like I felt empowered, right? And more than that, like I finally could buy what I was like looking for, like for a decade or so, like you know, over a decade. and i'll tell you why this is important like even today like when i start to work i still feel excited like every day morning i just can't like wait to wake up that's why i don't sleep a lot like i'm i'm usually excited and every day morning when i wake up as soon as i like like the first thing that i try to do uh, even before anything is to like just like catch up with where where we are at like with work or you know where the team is at because you know we have like a global team so i'm like usually i'm pretty excited and you know i fresh up and like do all those things a bit later but you know i'm pretty excited every day so at least that in a sense like uh, i mean i i had to think when you asked that question but definitely this is where this is what we always dreamt of like i knew that we could always start a business or a company or uh, things like that i did you know i did like i trained people on rubik's cube you know, i i had that skill I did do that in college, like held workshops, earned some money, trained people on open, like FOSS, free and open source software, things like that. But uh, you know, like that, I knew was possible. But today, like I personally think, like this is where we wanted to be, and we can, we could have been gone further. But definitely, like this is, you know, this is on track, and you know, I'm pretty excited every day, you know, to be doing whatever I'm doing. 
Yeah. When you say you could have gone further, where is that further dream? Where does Sisla, I want to know, share, share with us, yeah. where is the, the ending point? Where Where is it? If you want, of course, you don't have to share it, but uh, out of curiosity. I mean, I definitely do not see an end. So I think of things as like perpetual, but definitely they are not perpetual. What I, what I wanted to like convey there was uh, there were a few decisions, choices over the past decade that I personally took that led me to being here and nothing is, I don't regret anything. You know, personally, I think like every decision, small, big, you know, was important to being where we are today. But at the same time, you know, I personally think things could have gone better in terms of say me uh, managing finances well, or, you know, things that like I could have personally learned to do whatever I'm doing, you know, even better. Right. So I never like, I mean, I never did an MBA or like those are things that are like, you know, never gone into like formal training of anything. But I think like it's always in hindsight, right? You know, I think like having some of those skills like put in like not skills, but some of those frameworks uh, learned even before, like not now, but like before would have probably helped me take better decisions. But I don't know, right? Like it's a butterfly effect. So, you know, all of these things lead to where we are today. So I, I mean, I'll say I couldn't be happier. But definitely want to do more, you know, that's right. Nice, 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 nice. It's always, in my opinion, at least personal opinion, I think it's always cool to understand, you know, that people and vision and dream things like, and, and what is that vision and dream? I mean, there are some, I can tell you that over the last like three and a half years or whatever, some of the founders that we speak with, you know, sometimes you found out very interesting things, which you would never expect from people to say, you're like, wow, that's cool, man. There is like something... And it shows a really different side as well. I have um, another stigmatic question for you. Uh, I hope this is going to be the last stigmatic question I ask. But but it's an interesting, <laughs> I'm sorry, man, but it's an interesting one because India is becoming, I mean, you live in India and India is becoming, as recently overcame China in terms of population. And India has always been to the outside to a world, a very different country with a very different set of culture a very different set of rules, you know, the castes, all those things, you know, there is a lot to it which fascinate people and scare people and make people fall in love with India, depends on who you are, you know. I want to hear your opinion as not just somebody that was born and lives in India, but as a person with such ambitions, because you were talking about ambitions and they're not just ambitions, you have created already a project which is, you know, running and helping others to, to create more things. So you have achieved all those things. In your opinion, as somebody who did all that and as somebody who is working with that, what is, because what is the current situation in terms of India and adoption? Because in my opinion, India, well, at least by the population size, it plays a huge role in adoption, right? So what's your opinion on that? And I'm sorry for the stigmatic question, but I would really love to hear your opinion on this. Yeah, I mean, not at all. And what adoption? Internet blockchain? Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, Sisla. Well, I was in my own. I'm sorry. I just realized, you know what? After I asked it, I was like, oh, shit. I forgot to say what adoption. Sisla is probably going to correct me. So Web3, of course, I'm talking Web3. I'm really apologize for being silly. So Web3, <laughs> no, of course. Not at all. Uh, I'll say I attribute that to like, you know, I think about 50 or so years ago. Uh, no, people will kill me if I get this wrong. 70 plus years ago, we got independence uh, in 1947. And since then, <laughs> since then, like, uh, you know, the, India has like focused a bit or like a bit more than that on education, right? Like just before independence to, you know, people, they, like India was ruled by the British and English was a common factor in India actually like adopting English because even with the person that's from a neighboring state, I do not know their language. They do not know our language. We all know English, right? So that has played a huge role in actually say English medium education in the 70s, 80s and 90s. And by 90s, like everyone, like English medium became a default, uh, more or less like 80% of the country had access to English medium or I'll say 70% of the country had access to English medium education. And over these years, even if English was not your first language or and even if whether or not you had English medium education, you could like have access to all the resources, right? Like, and uh, the thing with India is that we missed a couple of revolutions. I'll tell you what happened. There was the phone, the landline and the cordless. 
and there was no laptop or computer revolution. We missed that and directly moved to a mobile revolution. Like, and we were like, mm. India was like the fastest. Like 2007, seven eight, you had like, you know, China producing mass, like mass producing phones, you know, like dumping them all over the world. India was like quick to adopt to mm-hmm. those because uh, you had what was like, you know, Nokia or Blackberry or a Chinese mm-hmm. phone. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. you know, people are like that preferred quality, bought Nokia, Symbian OS, and people that didn't care about that, bought a Chinese phone, you know, like it was low cost, but had internet. Right. And people didn't even get data packs until like, say, 2009. Right. And then you had uh, companies like Docomo from Japan that partnered with an Indian company and introduced like what is a per second billing and so on and so forth. Hence, mobile penetration like grew by quite a lot. And then you had an Indian company that got started with. Yeah, this is 2010. And once everyone had access to Internet, there was like a huge influx of digital media. So YouTube, Facebook, all of these like grew by like by quite a lot. Whichever platform had a presence in India or like among Indian audience, those grew like by quite a lot between 2010 and 15. And that like that was the time when, you know, like by then, by 2010, I, like we were the guys that were talking about digital, getting com- asking companies to get their own websites. You know, computer science education was like trending, if I can say. Right. And all of that put together, 2010 and 15 saw massive, massive adoption and 20, yeah, 15 to 20 was when we had like an influx. Like there was, I don't know if many are aware, but there was a demonetization event in India where in 2016, like all old notes were banned in four hours later, no old note could be used. Right. And this led to. And inf- like a massive, massive adoption of digital payments. And India has what is the UPI, where it is like a blockchain network. Uh, but I'm really not sure if they're using blockchain or not. But it exactly functions like a blockchain network. Every bank is on UPI. UPI stands for Unified Payments Interface. And UPI works exactly like a like you have what is Google Pay in India, which is like a MetaMask web, like mobile app. You have multiple clients you know there is the upi network all the banks are like serving the upi network part of the upi network and then there are multiple clients like google pay you know like everyone whatsapp everyone supports upi right and once like this was in place like india was onboarded to digital right like you had digitally native services you had digitally native like finance like apps you had digitally native like you know uh yeah everything that the world has to offer was accessible and, you know, companies like Google, Amazon, Microsoft, Facebook, like all of these companies, they took advantage of this, built services, products around this. And, you know, right now you can like, I'm in a city where if I want groceries in 15 minutes, I can actually get them in 15 minutes. Yeah. Like there are services where, you know, that is possible. And uh, yeah, it is possible in about like at least 30, 40 percent of the country, you have such services available. So you don't have any problem. And. Also, like India in like 2004, 5, 6 or 7, like you had access to the fastest internet. Like I do not know how that happened. Like I think like India cracked like good deals, but like it was like fucking fast. Like, you know, no, like developed countries also did not have that fast of an internet access. And, you know, like downloading a GB or, a, you know, like in 2010, downloading a GB was nothing. In 2007, of course, like you had a dial-up, not dial-up, but like 56 kbps or 64 kbps or something like that connection, 500 kbps. And you had to probably wait for like half an hour or more to be able to download. But uh, yeah, like by and by, like things improved like so much that, you know, people could not even catch up. Like people could not catch up. And everyone that was like over 40 or something, they all got on to WhatsApp. You know, like everything, they now know QR codes, they scan, they book a cab. You know, all of these things happen normally and no one like bats an eye and no one and even people that do not know English because of icons and you know all the optimizations, uh, you know, everything is accessible. So no one really localizes in India. Like I never accessed any app that was in Hindi. Like I don't even know Hindi properly. Right. So, yeah. Really? Are you serious? <laughs> wow. So do you think the same thing will happen with Web3 in India or it's already happening? Yeah, yeah, it is happening. This quick adoption. Actually, before there was, there is now like a blanket 
not like a blanket ban but i think it is not it is in dark gray area you have like high taxes and so on and so forth right now uh, in india to deal with crypto but uh, you know earlier when that didn't happen there is this league called ipl indian premier league which is for cricket to what super bowl and all those are for football oh no like here in the europe right epl <laughs> epl ipl is to cricket in india what epl is to <laughs> I, football i yeah. i i <laughs> Sorry. Actually, no. I was gonna say. I was gonna. No, no, don't be sorry. This is this is me pulling the quilt. Me interrupting you. Sorry. Like I was gonna just say that I grew up in the UK, so I actually uh, ha- had a lot, a lot, a lot of Indian. Uh, well, mostly from Punjab. A lot of friends when I was in high school. So I know a little bit more about Indian. Yeah, yeah, like the culture, yeah, and the preferences. I, I even played cricket. I don't understand fuck all about cricket, but 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 I even played it in high school. But I don't understand what's what's going on. I need. I know you need to run. I know. I know that much. But uh, <laughs> that's what I remember. But uh, yeah. No, so, sorry, sorry, man. I'm not good at cricket. <laughs> no, no, no worries. Like me neither. <laughs> me neither. Uh, but I know how big it is. You know, I look at cricket as like entertainment. Like <laughs> what a massive franchise like cricket has built. so i look at all those things but yeah like in like ipl had crypto ads like at one point in time you could not there was a break wow and during that break you only saw fintech and crypto ads you didn't see fmcg you didn't see amazons you didn't see those ads you saw like crypto exchange crypto product do this with crypto do that with crypto you saw fintech products where you could like get a policy get like loans and things like that but you you see like that because the population is typically young they are like into you know i'll just tell you an example like you know vouchers right like gift vouchers there's like a huge business around people like collecting those and these are digital vouchers coupon codes and they resell those and things like that all of these things happen and they game like vc funded startups uh, take like make a lot of money on those apps you know and, and do all those things so people are smart they just don't like not everyone gets crypto or like they still are a bit afraid because to operate in this ecosystem you actually you'll have to come down to the internet with money like 99% people don't come down to the internet with money you know they want to like be able to like navigate they pay once for internet and that's all that they want to do they might not even want to like pay for subscriptions but the ones that really get it they're already involved they're getting involved like rather quickly I think the reason my in my head at least personally that I'm so fascinated with what does India think even though I'm an anarchist right and I and I don't like the whole concept of countries and tarada but why India fascinates me personally is because in my opinion India with the um, diversity of its languages and communities is actually the closest example to a centralizedly uh, run decentralized country the amount of cultures and languages and nations inside of India is exactly that example of loads of decentralized societies of that are came over years and thousands of generations of rules of un- their different uh, mandates you know regardless if it was uh, chinese or in- or or english or mongolian or whatever you know to exist what it exists today i think we can by looking at india in the decentralized world learn a, a little bit of what to do correctly and what mistakes we we can expect already because india it, with it's been all those great cultural examples there are like you said yourself you know many things could have been better everything could be better and i think that's why i'm so fascinated with india because i'm fascinated with decentralization i think it's a very good example of decentralization india it's interesting and i'm not talking about on the national level of the national government i'm talking about you know those communities inside of india and communities inside of india and yes the people the real people the real people not the government the people yeah exactly i mean as uh, <laughs> correct like there's a famous tweet by uh, i mean or like you know i know that tweet i remember it uh, by balaji shrinivasan uh, he's pretty active in the yes right yes so of course. balaji says I'm bullish on Indians, not on India. Like that, like changed the perspective like quite a lot yes. for a lot of people. Yes, and they wanted like people to be bullish on India as a narrative, right? Like the current prime minister also like does push that quite a lot. Our state government also like encourages technology innovation. Like the place where I am, we have Apple, Google, Microsoft, Amazon's largest data center, Microsoft largest, uh, Amazon's warehouse largest da- warehouse. a data center 
Microsoft's largest data center, you know, multiple other banks, you know, tech companies. You no, know, all of these are there. And this was like a result of like, say, 30, 40 years of, I'd say, not planning. People could not have planned for this, but they were prepared for this. Where like they've doubled down, tripled down on education. They they just like focused on the most basic things like education infra. And that like that led a long way into like, you know, being this, I'll say like powerhouse or like an influx of people because like people got people ready and they didn't know what, what they would all do. <laughs> but people got ready for something that they wanted to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think I would carry on the malicious sentence here. I would say I am I'm bullish on people, mm. not on governments. So, yes. you know, and this is what I think, you know, I'm not bullish on governments, okay. I'm bullish on people. But mm-hmm. wait, man, let's get back to you and not inside of my uh, anti-governmental <laughs> head. Wait, um, let's talk a little bit about Omniflix. But before that, I'm going to play devil's advocate. I'm a content creator. So I'm not just a content creator, but I'm primarily a content creator. But my next question is going to be very devil's advocate. A lot of people, especially considering that the blockchain world is can be argued to still today be a highly technological universe space for people who are coders and yourself, you know, you're coming from a computer science background. So there is a lot of people out there. And the reason I'm asking you that, because we still haven't touched on Omniflix too much, but Omniflix is a platform for content creators and for communities. We will talk about it in more in a second, but first the question. Some people in crypto still today, and I understand where it's coming from, but I want to hear your opinion. Um, they see content creation and value as not exactly in the same league. So people say, oh, you're just a YouTuber. Oh, you're just, a, I don't know, a designer or, you know, you're just a, a meme guy. And what would you say to that? What would you, how would you reflect on that sentence? What does it, does it, why, why content creation? I mean, why did you decide to build a platform around communities? Yeah, I mean, this is the backbone of the internet. Like without a community, like your, whatever you build is like almost like however smart, however, you know, effective it might be. Like, you know, it just can't like sustain. Microsoft had all the resources. Linux had the community. Yes. They now power 98% of world servers. Right? Like that is what I see as community. And, you know, for the people that don't believe, yeah. I don't know, like, where you'll publish this, but I'll ask them to F off, right? Like, I don't care because, like, being able to, like, articulate what you innovate is the most important skill set that an innovator can have. Like, even though his innovation might not be the best, you know, if he can artic- if he or she can articulate that very well, you know, they can then present that idea generations later, like how you're using Tesla's concepts, you know, right now. Probably if Tesla would have had a better, you know, I don't know, like people that helped him communicate, you know, that made sure to, you know, be in those like power circles and things like that, world would have been different now. So it is probably, you know, like, yeah, these are some of the reasons. Like I personally think content creation is also creation from scratch. I'm not a creator myself, but I can't appreciate creators enough. Like beat anyone, like create someone that creates a meme is actually putting together multiple perspectives into one static image without writing like thousand words and then presenting it. Like what, be- like what better can it get, right? It's a unit of yeah. thought, like a meme yeah. is like a unit of thought. It represents a fraction of thought. So right from the smallest possible unit to like macro things, like a video, like a live stream, you know, all of these are like important. Like we we went to Cosmos 2022, but like Cosmos 2021, we were like doing it li- like we were doing it offline, like from India. And we heard people like there were people that came up to us and said, yeah, Omniflix, like you're doing a great job this year. But last year, like due to those live streams, like I really was motivated to come down to Cosmos. And this is my first ever IRL event. And I shared that this was my first IRL event as well, like from a Cosmos standpoint. And, you know, I couldn't have been more excited. And we are very glad that we could present all that was happening to the world outside. Because, you know, like that is the power of that live stream. The same is the case with, you know, your podcast or a video. You know, something is happening in the Celestia ecosystem. How will Ethereum people know? They don't follow GitHub. They don't probably care about, you know, the team or the company or the community of Celestia. But one idea that someone has yeah. that an effective thread can communicate is far 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 more effective than you know right like building a kick app that no one utilizes so yeah 
That's my thought. Thank you for saying that because it correlates personally like um, with our mission at Citizen Cosmos and our mission is to bridge layer zero with layer yes. zero being the community. And uh, this is what I refer to as layer zero, you know, and I think that no matter how many L1s, L2s, L3s, L27 we build, you know, end of the day, until AI replaces all of us, we're still here and uh, we need to communicate and blockchain is a communication tool and somebody needs to bridge that. And it's fascinating, by the way, you know, I, I'm going to give you, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, but I'm, I have to give you this example because it happened to me yesterday. The, the power of semantics, the power of what words mean to us, you know, I live in, in, an, in an island and people here speak Portuguese. I am learning Portuguese and, you know, I've learned one phrase. Of course, I'm learning from my girlfriend, you know, and, you know, she teaches me, of course, sometimes funny things, sometimes a bit, uh, you know, not, 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 not good to That's say, you know, not, but, at, yeah. <laughs> but I realized, yeah. <laughs> but, but it, it is, but what I realized about semantics, man, was a very powerful thing. We were at a barbecue with our friends. It was a couple of days ago, yesterday or the day before yesterday, and there were kids there and they were saying that sentence. There is no swear words in it. It's just using normal words. But because I learned it in a way which my brain memorized it as used, you know, in a kind of funny, like adult way yeah. to me, even with the kids were saying that I was like, oh, my God, why am I th this is like <laughs> wrong. You know, my brain is <laughs> makes that stupid connection. Yeah. And this is the power of semantics, how powerful words can be, you know, like, boom, it's like, wow, crazy, man, crazy. 100%. Sisla, let me ask you something mm -hmm. about Omniflix, man. What is the mission of Omniflix? Mm. I want to know what is, in your opinion, in your opinion, what is the mission of Omniflix? So it is like pretty simple, right? Sovereign publishing platforms are you no know, sovereign way for you to manage, distribute and monetize your content. And this is like pretty fixed, you know, like. It might sound like too vague or, you know, it might sound as if like it is, you know, larger than life mission. Yes, it can be, but sometimes it's not as well because uh, we've seen platforms like WordPress grow. We've seen what YouTube does even now, did earlier, the total amount of revenue that they take. And this is also, again, like Google AdWords revenue, right? And, you know, all of these things, like when we see how all these systems when we saw how all these systems functioned, we appreciated them for various reasons. We also did not like a few ways in which they operated. And we felt that, you know, working on Omniflix will help us improve that. And, you know, we found our community in the blockchain ecosystem. Like we, we already did this. We were working on this, like even with or without blockchain, like we were helping teams or organizations, you know, manage their content, like distribute it effectively get the right word out at the right time and, you know, be able to monetize that effectively so that all they can do is like just create content and still survive, right? But it was all in a Web2 centric way. When it came to Web3, there was this additional superpower that we felt was part of Web3 infrastructure, which is sovereignty and Cosmos like displays, demonstrates that like no other technology, piece of infra. So, you know, hence utilizing Cosmos, like I'll say, being able to provide those sovereign management distribution and publishing and monetization platforms, you know, is at the core of what we're doing at Omniflix. So if we complete this in say 10 years, I'm very happy to like, I won't say let this go, but if at some point in time, there is someone better or if there are like, you know, better people that can do this and take the mission even further, like nothing like it, right? So this is what we are aiming for. And, you know, we want to make sure that you know, over a period of time, this infrastructure is built at various levels, right? For a small creative to a larger organization that deals only with media to an organization that doesn't even care about media. So all of them should have the tools. And, you know, if they're all on a level playing field, like how the internet changed things, like I think a lot of things will change. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Man. And hope that is the what is going to be. You know, I was asking in, um, I was in Lisbon during the blockchain week and I asked, uh, I interviewed like people from Chorus One, from Stakefish, from, uh, uh, I don't remember if P2P was on that. No, I don't think so. But, you know, there was quite like um, a lot of people who you could argue are successful founders within the Web3 uh, world and, and then beyond it, you know, some of them definitely, uh, those numbers can be taken into the real world, you know, and I was asking all of them, the same or a similar set of questions. And one of them was, and this is what I'm going to ask you as well, 
Um, of course, Omniflix is still young, but I want to ask that anyways, because you don't have to think only about Omniflix. The question was more or less this. Do you think that what you are building and doing, um, okay, but for, not from a high point, but do you really think that people out there, you know, with everyday lives, you know, because, you know, we are all, we all live in a different parts of the world and you yourself, you know well, how it can be, you know, you know how, how it can get, unfortunately. Um, do you think that we are here, all of us, and of course, not just he, we, because it's about you today, but do you think what you are building will really help people? Will it really solve something for them in their everyday life? Will they even care about that? Why, you know, do you think that is something that is realistic, what I'm saying, for them to care about that? Yeah, like actually good question. Like if we would have built for everyone, like we would have failed on day one or like day hundred or day thousand. Here we are not building for everyone. Like that's why I think I personally think even in the Web3 space or I don't know, like even in the Cosmos, some people might not really understand what we are up to. But at the same time, like the ones that actually talk to us that actually are feeling this problem or, you know, will have this problem in the future, they see like true potential in what we are building. So I'll say this is for a subset of people that are actually looking to create like manage, distribute and monetize content. And for all the consumers out there, right, these tools will help them see like better content, you know, help them manage. So I've known like, you know, open source projects that died, you know, too many tokens like in the crypto space, like Web3 space that, you know, did not like make it. Uh, I hope we are not one of them, at least like that's what we're working towards. But regardless of our Web3 like side of things, like what are we doing on the media tech side of things? You know, this can be reused by any community, Web2, Web3, like even in future, like if there is any other community, we're pretty sure that these frameworks will help them utilize. So this is like an algorithm, but like scaled to a framework, which will like enable people to implement in any language. I mean, just letting you know that about that analogy, but you know, in our case, like I'm, I perfectly, or rather I, I believe 100% that what will we do, whether we are able to distribute that in the best possible way or not, we are hundred percent sure that this will, this can be used and we'll identify distribution channels, not just in us or like, you know, our team or like Omniflix community or something like that, but we'll identify distribution channels to make this work because until that day, I don't think our work has ended just building something and, you know, praying that people will use it, like makes no sense. And, you know, for people to actually find value, they'll have to know how Omniflix infrastructure can add value. So, you know, yeah, I believe that this will be used whether or not like Web3 and, you know, Web3 is making sure that we incentivize the right people, we align incentives to the right stakeholders. You know, that is what we're probably utilizing the Web3 layer or the Web3, uh, yeah, the Web3 layer for, to be able to align incentives to the right people. Because like, you know, you can run a live stream whether or not Web3 infra. You can run a server whether or not Akashnet. You can run, yeah, you can do all of these things. Like, I don't know, right? Like without the blockchain, you could sell art, but why NFTs? So, you know, all of these things put together, like are shaping up content as we know. And like this infrastructure, we believe is the first step in like enabling people run their own, like, you know, media studio. Why should only a Times or like uh, whoever it is, right? Like a BBC or a Fox should run an empire, right? There are hundreds of thousands of independent creators that have like far more content, like quantity, and we never know quality because we don't see it on those channels, right? So that is something that we are aiming for. And, you know, we believe this will like outlast what we'll be doing and specifically Web3 or not, you know, this would still be something that we would be up to, you know? Yeah. I think Joe Rogan, by the way, is a great proof to what you say, right? Joe Rogan per average has, um, I'm a bit scared to get the numbers wrong right now, so please don't quote me on that, anyone. But um, I, I, if I'm not mistaken, on average, Joe Rogan has two to three times more uh, viewers per episode than uh, CNN News or Fox News or anyone else. Yeah. So what is mainstream media? You know, that is a good question. <laughs> Who is the mainstream, yeah. you know? <laughs> exactly. So, uh, but it's cool, as, and it's proof to what you say that it's working, man. Absolutely. So, and and hopefully more and more creators, not just Joe Rogan, with kudos to his work, you know, can can achieve that with the help of Web three, man. I have an uncomfortable question for you about Omniflix. Um, it's not uncomfortable, really. It's a devil's advocate question. 
but you know um we are in the content <laughs> creation business now. i'm joking, I'm joking. <laughs> no, but, uh, yeah. about omniflix and usd mm-hmm. there was a lot of talk about omniflix and you know uh, uh, using prices and quoting prices in usd and in some why usd why peg things to the usd man why not <laughs> use peg things to atom i don't know correct so the thing was that like you know threefold i'll, I'll <laughs> give you three like three point answer to please this. first like we we were already like going ahead and like displaying nft listings in uh whatever they were listed in say atom or osmo you know who are ikt so these were the listings that were supported now what happened was like people wanted first something stable which we could not offer if we didn't support a stable coin and at this point in time like we were too afraid to like you know say support bridge tokens you know luna usd uh bridge hacks and everything else afterwards you know we only wanted to like support native tokens you know that was like another point but that didn't help because like people could not like plan for you know specific things if they didn't see values in usd and the other fact was that because of too many tokens we were like collectors were not able to like do their research or do their due diligence and identify an nft or you know yeah an nft that was listed because they had to like navigate between multiple tokens and so on and so forth so the common denominator right now is usd where the price is shown in usd but is still listed in atom and going forward right we aim to integrate like other currencies as well where we are seeing traffic from uh you know we do see traffic from europe we do see traffic from actually africa as well but you know that traffic is again it's like too many currencies to support so we did not like take that initiative even i'll say the, the euro specific traffic we did not like think or consider supporting euro at this point in time but with demand you know we are very open the same applies for like the multiple other currencies like the korean uh, won or you know japanese yen is also something that you know like a community there are like uh, creators that spread the word about their collections in japan they have their community sorted now you know the same is the case with china as well but in our case like we just went ahead with usd because people could filter you know everything and like you know quickly access but we have no affinity towards usd like everyone you know if there is demand for usdc you know we'll 100% go and add that we've had that demand like people asked but we did not like you know we were like too anxious to support a bridge token right now and uh, you know like revoke support and things like that so you know never got to supporting usdc or ax and usdc but like actually we are connected with axlar like relay technically co- connected with axlar and you know we also like bridged uh, axl usdc into the omniflix ecosystem nfts can be listed in axl usdc even now and transactions can happen we just like did not go down that route to support it yet Yeah. It makes sense to be honest that the visibility isn't something people are used to. I I totally understand that. Yeah, because like uh, it's more of a devil's advocate question <laughs> to understand. No, no, like like you like we have Chuawa being supported for example and say 99,000 Chuawa or something that the NFT is listed for, you know, doesn't pop up in like a low to high search, you know, or a filter or a sort and things like that. But you know if you end up uh saying 5 or 10 or 20 you know it's easy for all those nfts and you know it's clear that as soon as someone like start like clicks on collect they see the token that the native token that the nft is listed in so it's not like we are hiding that token completely the details but just like using usd as a common denominator yeah i can tell you by a secret that when we were building golos in 2016 uh, the the fork of steemit we were doing the same thing we had mm. an internal currency but the prices were shown mm. to the people either in dollars or in rubles or in euros so they chose the, they you, we were doing exactly the same thing you guys are doing and that is the correct way i was just wondering in my opinion at least i was wondering like uh, how how does it work behind the the background i mean i have a Sorry, sir. No, go on. Sorry, sorry. No, no, no. Go on, go on. Please, 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 go on. Like, I have a quick question. Sure, sure, sure. <laughs> I have a question for you. Then, like, if we, like, in future, we'll build Omniflix TV oh. where people can like publish VOD videos, uh, like live sessions can run and so on and so forth. If someone wants to tip, right? Like, how do you want people to tip? Do you want people to tip 
five or ten or fifteen or twenty dollars, or do you want them to tip one or two atoms? I think it's not about. Um, I will answer from a very. Uh, I will try to be very objective. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's important that those tips will be in crypto, and I think one of the main reasons mm-hmm. is to avoid any bureaucratic issues. Because when you tip in the person in dollars or in euros. Mm-hmm. You kind of playing around with bureaucratic issues that there is no need to play with. When you tip in a person in cryptocurrency, uh, luckily for us today, that doesn't mean anybody for anything. So anybody can accept cryptocurrency. It's like accepting, yeah. uh, you know, because some content creators, not us particularly, but some content creators, they stick with legalities. Mm. And I totally respect and understand that it's their choice. I will not be the one to tell them no. But especially for them, you know, instead of going through the whole process of accepting dollars as tips and making money in that they can say well i'm accepting uh, i don't know whatever whatever not to slag them off but you know it's not regulated by anyone so when it's like that it's already then up to them whether or not and what they do with it but at least it will save at least this is how i see it now i might be totally wrong no but that would be my opinion i mean like 99 we won't support fiat the thing is that like if they'll have to like choose so you can imagine it to be like this they'll anyways like consider that they'll anyways tip in crypto but the first screen that they see like as soon as they hit tip the options that are presented to them might look like five dollars ten dollars fifty dollars or hundred dollars mm-hmm. as soon as you click on five it might ask you for say atom or flicks or whatever and then like send it to your address but do you want to see the usd value or do you want people to see crypto tokens directly? What do you think? Now, again, if you're asking like me, Citizen Cosmos, I would say I would like to see the crypto values. But I'm assuming, being trying to be objective, mm. that I think that for a lot of people that would be uncomfortable. And the reason I say crypto is because my personal goal in life and, and also with Citizen Cosmos is to try to to make things better, you know, to build a better world. And I think one of the problems is fiat currencies. And I think the more we educate the world about the existence of other things, the more people will accept it. But with that, I'm, I'm objective. And I think that that might be very uncomfortable for a lot of people. So I'm assuming that people would prefer seeing... But you could overplay it, you know, you could overplay it very easily by uh, in the settings of an account, let's say a person has settings and they could choose default currency and somebody could choose seeing in Bitcoin, somebody in in dollars, somebody in Atom. Yeah. And then everybody gets to see the customization they want to see, right? Correct. Correct. Like at this point in time, it is like that default is tokens. So to the top right corner of the marketplace, you hit what is like a toggle between USD and tokens. And then only then you'll see values in USD because like sometimes people don't think in USD. Okay. Like for crypto folks, F3 folks, they think in USD, but uh, I don't. Oh oh, yeah. (laughs) I mean like the prices and all are usually. I don't man. I think in ether, I think in ether and atom. (laughs) Oh yeah. (laughs) Of course. Of course. You know, like NFTs are not thought of in dollars. People would like, you know, people would go crazy if they think of NFTs in dollars. Uh, yeah, they they'll probably think of them in ETH or you know like the native token, you know, uh, Flix or you know, any other token. Yeah. Sometimes I look at the price of things in the shopping mall and I'm like, that costs 0.1 Ether? Are you guys serious? Like, I would not pay like 0.1 Ether for that, you know? Oh, man, I'm serious. Though. I'm like that, man. I'm crazy when it comes to that. No, no, no. You're, you're absolutely right. This is this is what happens to us as well. Yeah, ah, it's okay. Yeah, it's yeah. okay. <laughs> it's no. Sisla, yeah. man, the blitz. Sure. Let's get into it. I have three mm-hmm. questions for you. So, first one. Give me three projects mm-hmm. uh, that are interest you technologically. They don't have to be crypto projects. Mm-hmm. It could be any project in the world. Something, three things that interest you as projects technologically. Okay, like uh, there are these GANs, like video AI GANs that I'm personally, I was fascinated with them since like 2016, 17, when the first set of research came out. Even now it hasn't like fully materialized, but you can imagine a text to video you know, that can be created, but, you know, like, well done, right? Like, and those, like those GANs, like generative adversarial neural networks, they have been like uh, evolving quite a lot in the last five years. I'm like, as research, I'm like personally bullish on that because I personally think that will solve like a lot of problems, not just in the media space, 
but also outside like for cellular biology research or you know it can be anything because these are all like thousands of frames under a microscope and you put them together to form what is like a video all these frames and then you do your analysis like go ahead with your analysis so these are things that like this fascinated me quite a lot been following that research of course did not build anything myself but you know i've been following the research and you know quite bullish on that as a tech right like gans and you know especially gans in in media right so that is one <laughs> i should say i'm like i really like celestia yeah Next i one. really like celestia for what they're doing okay and you know i uh, i like what the founders also think of how they you know present things and you know yeah like i like i like what is happening there right so i understand that is like you know from a crypto native standpoint and you know something like technology internet technology and crypto native but uh moving out of like internet as a whole right i really like uh companies that have like huge huge distribution like channels that build their distribution channels from the ground up right like there are there is a company in india it's called idc like they're like extremely massive i can't compare it with any other company it's like a philip morris plus a marriott plus stedler plus wow. you know like a few few companies put together it's like a public a uh, private corporation it started like way earlier but their distribution channels are like extremely unique and i've seen that strategy get implemented time and again i mean in the internet realm they are called growth hacks but you know they exist in the real world too and uh, i really like what they're doing i'm not like probably a fan of the company or whatever idc stands for like indian tobacco corporation so they sell cigarettes uh, but they're like massive and uh, you know their distribution goes as like further than any government right like any yeah you get you get idc products in like the remote remotest parts of india right and that is a strategy that has like and to be able to get there they used a lot of strategies and there are like quite a lot of case studies as well so you know i'm i'm like extremely bullish on you know companies that identify their distribution channels and build them like double down and build them so you no know, yeah that is you know those are three uh, things that i'm like personally bullish on yeah. that was a surprise i like i love that answer by the way this is a very good answer thank you mm -hmm. the last part fantastic man yeah second question give me two motivational things that you in your daily life that exist that keep sisla building um not just omniflex but keep sisla going keep sisla trying you know to uphold the values that you were talking about just getting on with your daily life what are those two things that help you keep going i mean if i have to talk about like the zero index in the array like array may zero like uh, like the first thing i'll answer that you know it is the people around me yeah and this is this might be like common but i personally like i have like friends that i known like our friends since like the last say 15 years 10 years like over a decade is like pretty common what does it mean like that means that did i not make any new friends in the last like few years obviously not like i i did <laughs> i did make friends but at a personal level you connect with a few people and you know that if that is like one i read a quote when i was in 12 on a college prospectus like an admission test that i had to take and that like changed the way i saw things like i do not know like it was by aristotle or plato or you know socrates like one of these guys and the quote goes like this you are what you do repeatedly therefore excellence is not an act but a habit that was like mind blowing to me i don't know why like those set of words they just changed the way i saw things and then i like from then on like it was a long game i never like did anything for the short term like personally like even now if you look at like how i do not know like omniflex operates none of the things that we do are like short term in nature so like that like that has changed the way i saw things right and that has led me to being able to like be like excellent that is not a destination but a journey so i am aware of that but you know i just do my best personally and you know i try to push everyone else to do their best so you know sometimes people like me for that like sometimes they don't but at the same time you know end of the day like when everyone sees that output like the way it actually is meant to be everyone is happy they'll forget all their worries like all the effort all the sacrifices that they made 
and seeing that in action seeing that get to life is like you know mesmerizing you know personally for me so i like that is another quote that i live by and of course like i said before like creating things that do not exist you know that definitely motivates me and you know creating things that don't exist don't like not just means like new tech but a new way of doing things like auctions existed internet existed then came ebay and then amazon took over ebay and then xyz happened so you know combination of two things can lead to like far more it can be far more effective the results can be exponential so these are the things that i think you know like i'm motivated by like no one has asked me this question so i had to think but if you ask me quickly like these are the things that i think i'm like uh you know yeah pretty inspired take inspiration from yeah curiosity exploration i think it's uh, what makes us uh, intelligent i think it's uh, by the way it's an aristotle uh, quote but it, i know that there's a story behind that quote that they say that uh, it wasn't really aristotle who said it it was somebody who was trying to explain it and the aristotle quote was similar but but it's ah, aristotle okay. if i'm not mistaken <laughs> um last one Yeah. Give me uh, one person, dead, alive, real, a uh, writer, doesn't matter. It could be a cartoon character. It could be a GitHub person you follow. Mm-hmm. It could be anyone in the world. Uh, and it doesn't, mm-hmm. they don't have to be real. Uh, that inspires you. Doesn't influence you, but inspires mm-hmm. you. <laughs> I do not know. Like, I take inspiration from wherever there is good. Uh, okay. I mean I should say I do not know because you know I've been inspired equally from what say a Bill Gates did or what a Steve Jobs did you know I really like like a few things and do not like a few things so I mean very hard it's okay you don't have to answer that role model type I mean that persona in my head doesn't exist but although it exists like it's a combination of different personas so you know quite a lot of people like I've read I've got into reading biographies I don't read fiction. Mm-hmm. I only read non-fiction. Yeah, right? And uh, biographies are pretty interesting because those are like real stories that happen and like how people like, I don't know, in some sense, like overcame some of those difficulties, you know, thought about perspectives that people didn't. So, you know, in that sense, the most common, you know, inspirations would be uh, like role models uh, in that sense would be the people that like, that invented things created things like you know the steam engine the cars the industries you know the automotive yeah things like that and the internet electricity so these inspired me like i cannot like name names like too many to name like linus torvalds like creator of linux like he inspired me as well in some sense that you know he proved that like at 20 you could do anything and that could change the world in like 10 years and you know that was actually something that we had like we needed you know because as a kid I never saw someone that changed things like in front of my eyes right like for real I heard stories I always knew history was like corrupted you know by the people that wrote history but uh, you know all these things yes. put together we had to like have yes. those validations those real examples and you know I found the internet to be inspiring enough you know I I could see the bad as well like I found bitcoin for other reasons but at the same time you know like internet as a whole you know could be has inspired me quite a lot so sorry for the long answer and not like a straight straightforward answer but yeah it's it's beautiful and it's beautiful man i love answers like that i i i love the answers like that and by the way i think it was isaac azimov right who said that the most dangerous weapon in <laughs> history uh, invented it's it's not uh, yeah. the will or yeah. or machine gun it's history whoever controls history controls all yeah. all of yeah. the universe yeah. it's interesting sisla Man, it's been a huge pleasure to finally record you. Uh, it really is, really has. Um, I'm glad to that we are finally connected. And uh, thank you very much, man, for your answers. No, thank you. Thank you for those questions. Like, they, I personally had to, like, think a lot before when I said anything. And this was, yeah, like, I, before, like, off record also, we talked about me being me and, like, you know, talking about these things. I definitely was myself during all of this interview. and you know pretty glad i'm like really really glad that uh, you know we got on together and after all these years of uh, hearing citizen cosmos yes now i get to hear myself you know in on spotify Yay. and you know all the other distribution channels so, thank you you know thank you for having me
Thank you, man. And thanks, everybody, for listening. Thanks. Bye. This content was created by the Citizen Cosmos Validator. If you enjoyed it, please support us by delegating to Citizen Cosmos and help us to create more educational content.